Welcome to the Talent Grow Show, where you can get actionable, results-oriented insight and advice on how to take your leadership, communication, and people skills to the next level and become the kind of leader people want to follow. And now, your host and leadership development strategist, Haleli Azulai. Welcome back, Talent Growers, to another episode of the Talent Grow Show. I'm Haleli Azulai, your leadership development strategist here at Talent Grow. And my guest this week is Dr. Yoram Solomon. Now, he doesn't put himself forward as a comedian, but he has me giggling the whole time. Plus, he packs this conversation full of very useful information and lots of very interesting food for thought about innovation, trust, communication, political correctness. We kind of go on a very wide range of topics, all of them related to how you can increase the innovation in your team, starting with yourself. I look forward to hearing what you thought about it, but without further ado, here is episode 72. Welcome back, Talent Growers. This is Halalia Zulai, your leadership development strategist here at Talent Grow. And my guest this week is Dr. Yoram Solomon, the corporate creativity doctor. He's a passionate innovation and creativity thought leader, the founder of Corporate Innovation Academy and Large Scale Creativity, published six books, nine patents, and is one of the creators of the Wi Fi and USB technologies, and also a pilot, among other things. Yoram, welcome to the show. Thank you, Lily. Great to be here. It's great to have you. You are an interesting and uh, multi talented person. Today we're going to dive into your latest book. But before we do, give us a brief overview of your professional journey. Where did you start? How did you get to where you are today? Well, I was born on a dark day. Yeah, <laughs> okay, Maybe not that back. okay. <laughs> right after my military service, I started working for a company and uh, very quickly I realized that I wanted to start my own startup company. So I did that. And uh, while I did that, I decided that if you really want to be in the startup environment, maybe the 408 area code is the right area code for you. So I got on a plane with my wife that was six months pregnant, landed in San Francisco, started our lives in uh, in the U.S. Meanwhile, I got my law degree, my MBA, and my PhD. And I started working for another tiny company, which I sold later. I started growing in uh, the other company. And when I was doing my PhD, it was time to work on my dissertation, my research. And as I was struggling with what topic will I use for my research, uh, I had many topics. And my mentor at the university was trying to get something that I'm very passionate about out of me. And at some point, I said, you know what? You know what I'm really passionate about? Or I probably use different words then, but uh, I said, I'm trying to understand. I don't understand why are people so much more creative when they work in startups than when they work in large companies. And at the time, I was working for a Texas Instruments with 35,000 employees. And I could feel the difference, but I couldn't put my finger on exactly why. And he said, I think we just found what you're passionate about. And I started working on my dissertation. I did my research for about two years, really answering that question. Why are people so much more creative when they work for startups than when they work in large companies or mature companies? Well, right after I defended it, and you hear the last words that really are the end of your journey, congratulations, Dr. Solomon. Wow. The first acronym that comes to my head is SWWC. So what? Who cares? <laughs> so, so I know. I know why are people more creative when they work in startups, but who cares? And what I realized is that I found something else in the process. I found what large companies, mature companies, companies with 35,000 employees or more can do to out-innovate startups. As a result, that was the time I published book number four, Unkill Creativity, and the subtitle was just that, How Corporate America Can Out-Innovate Startups. And at that point, I think I found a new mission in life, and my mission became to help corporate America bring innovation back. Well, I'm sure that's part of why you're so successful, because I know that that's a major hotspot for a lot of organizations. They feel the startups nipping at their heels and they want to figure out something to do about it. And congratulations on your most recent book, which is titled Culture Starts With You, Not Your Boss, kind of a 
edgy title there. And I looked at your book, very nice, has nine short stories. You kind of teach through the stories, but then you also pull out the lessons. You have an interview with each of the characters from the story as a way of teaching. And also, you know, a couple of different chapters that are written more like in the business book fashion, where they just sort of go straight towards, you know, the theories and the ideas and the practices. So in this book, you say that you've evolved your thinking over your career about innovation. You're now in a third stage of thinking that there's this vicious cycle of trust and innovation, and you think that you're able to help people overcome that vicious cycle or sidestep it in some way if we think that employees actually can proclaim autonomy and take the liberty to do what's right for their company without permission. So this, to me, sounds like mutiny. So I know you want to talk about that some more. So yes, I promote mutinies uh, in all <laughs> companies, and uh, that would be the end of your uh, uh, web of your uh, podcast. Right. Uh, but <laughs> but uh, no, uh, more seriously. Initially, when I after I I realized why are people more creative in startups, people wanted to know, and you know you can't boil down two years of research into two three words. But actually, I found that I can use one word and explain it, and that is culture. It really comes down to culture. So who controls culture? You have to ask yourself, and people ask me, and the common thought is that culture is controlled by management, by the top executives, by the CEO. They are the ones who control culture. So if you don't have the right culture for you to be innovative, to be creative, that's not your fault. That is your boss's fault. And as I started thinking through Stories of from my own life, and you know, one interesting uh, fact about the book, by the way, is other than one story, the story of Adam, uh, story number four, I was part in each one of the other eight stories. I, you just don't know which part I took. Hmm. But the first one, I'll tell you, Drew, the story of Drew, I was Drew, huh. and that was the story of USB three. That's how USB three happened, and it happened when I walked to my senior VP to give him a business plan of uh, what would be a $533 million business. And he asked, uh, did any of our customers ask for it? And I said, well, no, because they don't know it's coming. And he said, well, then call me when uh, one of our customers are, is interested. I went home that night. I was ready to resign. I was ready to write my resignation letter and say, you know, this, this is not for me. Mm-hmm. I can't do this. I woke up in the morning and I realized that it was up to me, that that idea would have fallen through the cracks because I took no for an answer. And at that point, I decided I'm not taking no for an answer. I went to, uh, I identified the three engineers that could put a demonstration together that we're going to take to Intel up in Oregon. And for about two, three weeks, they worked. I told them up front, look, I need you to work on this. This is going to be big which it is because there are 4 billion USB 3 ports shipped every year now. I told them that was going to be big. We need to work on this prototype. You're the only people that can do that. But our boss said no. And so you can't tell anybody. It can't be at the expense of your day job. And if you tell anybody, you'll get in trouble and I can't help you. Little did I know that this is actually value proposition for an engineer. They want to get in trouble. They want to work on black projects, you know, skunk works. And so uh, they just did it. And three weeks later, we flew over to Oregon. We showed the demonstration to uh, Intel. And as they say, the rest is history. Wow. So these people, they were just your peers. Did they report to you? Did you have authority to tell them to do this? Or they you proposed this and they chose of their free will to do it? Oh, so so that's a funny uh, story by itself, because uh, when I was sitting there at Intel in Oregon, and they said, we don't have the resources, I said, don't worry about it, I have the resources. Except at that point, I had no person reporting to me. I was a general manager running a group of 89 people. But at that point, I was the strategist, I had nobody reporting to me. So I'm flying back home from Oregon thinking, what did I just do? I just told them that I have the resources, I, I have nothing. But I went there and that's what I told them. You're not working for me. You're in our general group, but I need your help. You're the only ones that can do it. An unsanctioned activity. And they did it. So their motivation was the excitement of being part of something new or the covertness of it, you think? 
It, it is a combination. It is uh, they believed in it. They they saw my enthusiasm, my confidence that this is going to be successful. They knew how to do it. They knew how things were in the company, and it was an exciting thing. It was uh, we're going to be working on something that nobody approved. So uh, there is an element of excitement in it. So I have to ask you, so who's your audience for this book? Are you trying to get employees to take action without permission? Or are you trying to somehow get companies to instill this kind of culture? Well, there are two sides to it. On one hand, it's the employee taking action without, uh, I'll, I'll say without authorization. But on the other hand, this book also talks to, when you read this, it talks to the executives, to the managers who would say, you know, maybe I shouldn't just tell them not to. Maybe I should not stop them. Uh, it kind of builds on the coattails of uh, the fourth book, uh, Unkill Creativity, uh, where I actually told management, and, and in many, many workshops that I described that framework, I asked managers and executives and CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, I asked them, what do you do when one of your employees comes to you telling you they tried something without your permission and failed? Mm -hmm. What do you do? And their first answer is, don't do it again. The second answer is, next time, ask first. Both of those are creativity killers. The one creativity factor that, that would promote creativity, I should say, is, okay, what have you learned from it? And, you know, maybe I know somebody in another group that tried something like what you tried here. Why don't, I'll make the contact between the two of you. Go ask him or her, what did they do that was successful? Maybe that's going to help you. But you need the employee to leave the office going, well, that wasn't the end of the world. That's awesome. And that's the, that is the startup culture, I would say, in gen, I mean, if you, we can generalize, is that they, you know, they would kind of say, what's the cliche, fail fail quick, fail often, something like this? It is. This, this is the uh, framework of Lean Startup as well, mm -hmm. which is try quickly, try new things, see if they work. You need to upfront, you need to know what you want to learn from it, learn it, and then change direction, change course. Yeah, and pivot. So interesting. I, I can totally see how if managers and, and leaders take your advice, then they'll change how they respond to innovation attempts. They'll change how they respond to people making mistakes in pursuit of innovation or, or learning. And that will change the course of how those people will then react. And it'll kind of open up that virtuous cycle of people trying things versus being afraid and covering their tail, which unfortunately I think is more the case in many corporate cultures. You know, everybody's just trying to cover their backside. And I think trust is probably a very big part of that. And I know that in your book, you describe a formula for trust, which we don't have time to, you know, everybody get Yorm's book. It's really good. And it's available. I'll link to it on in the show notes. But uh, could you describe the formula briefly, just to get us an overview of the key components? Yes, in, in general, that formula, and thank you for asking that. Uh, I really wanted to talk about that. The formula is really, what it says is, trust is the sum of all interactions between two people. That's how you build trust. The interactions are measured by the time you spend together. I mean, if you spend one minute a month, that's not going to build trust very quickly. Mm. The, the intensity of the interaction, and if you're familiar with the 738-55 rule, that's where, you know, 7% of uh, your content intention, your likability factor is conveyed through words, 38% through the tone of voice, 55% through your body language or facial expressions. Yeah, well, this is if, the Arabian yes, research. Yes, that's right. And really what he was talking about is the likability factor, not necessarily communication, yeah. but likability really works for trust. So in order for me to like you to, to start building that trust... Writing emails is not going to be enough. Just talking over the phone is not going to be enough. Face-to-face -face communications is going to be much better. And there are actually things even beyond face-to-face -face that I'm not going to dive into right now. 
And the third part is the positivity of those interactions. Are those positive interactions, uh, say, plus 100%, or are those negative interactions, minus 100%? And if you look at the formula, you'll see that there is something weird that I'm doing with that positivity, and that is be because I'm using the broaden and build uh, framework or, or theory by Barbara Fredrickson. Yeah. Yep, yeah. And, um, you know, when I try to explain what does it mean, because what she's saying is that we react three times stronger to negative things than to positive things. And when, when I need to demonstrate this, I have the best demonstration. I was born on January 8th. I share a birthday with Elvis Presley, David Bowie, Stephen Hawking, and Kim Jong-un. <laughs> So when you hear the Kim Jong-un, it kind of wipes out the first three, right? <laughs> and that's exactly what Broughton and Bill says. It's, you know, you react to a negative event three times stronger than to the three positive ones that, that you just had before. So those, all of those together, the time we spend together, the intensity of that uh, interaction and the positivity of that interaction, the sum of all those interactions builds trust. Got it. Okay. So let me make sure I summarize it. So it's how much time you spend with someone and how, or how many interactions you have with them. And also the nature of your interactions, the more that you can actually see here, you know, kind of get the full spectrum of communication, the better. And also the ratio of positive to negative being high. Those are the three really important parts. Exactly. Cool. I like it. Very cool. So if you're saying that we need to build trust, and I know that in another conversation, we can talk more about trust. That's a topic that I'm very, very interested in. You say that there is also a component of it that is related to conflict, right? You, you kind of have yeah. five, five pieces to the puzzle. Give us an overview of the five pieces, but really, really quick. And then maybe we can dive into constructive conflict. There's a particular quote I really liked in your book. You say, stop focusing on not hurting other people's feelings unintentionally and start focusing on not letting your own feelings get hurt by people who had no such intention. So overview the five pieces and let's talk about that. Yes, yeah, so the five pieces, that model really has two sides to it. On one side, the corporate side, so that is employer, employee, manager, uh, and a subordinate. And on the, the other side, on the team side, you have people at the same level of hierarchy. Then on the top side of that uh, framework, you have the positive factors, and on the bottom side, you have the negative ones. So if you look at the corporate, at the hierarchical trust or uh, relationship, you have on the positive side autonomy, on the negative side, bureaucracy. So increase your auto the autonomy you give people, which is what I talked about before, and reduce the bureaucracy, the things that, that hold them back. On the team side, the positive is the constructive conflict, the negative our office politics or competition, internal competition. In the middle, there is this part that I call trust. And trust erodes in the presence of bureaucracy or office politics. Trust helps build autonomy and constructive conflict. That's kind of in a nutshell, the model. Yeah. Okay, cool. And, uh, and of course, maybe we can include a picture or something on the show notes in case folks are Curious to see what it looks like. Of course, in the book, you can see there is a picture. So what's this business about the people's feelings and not hurting others, not worrying about hurting others? I'm really intrigued by that. Actually, I'll just say that as of probably today or tomorrow, there's going to be a couple of pages on my website under books. If you go to that book, Culture Starts With You, because it's available on an audible, on audiobook, it, the, the charts, all those diagrams in color, in full color, are going to be available for free uh, over cool. there. So people nice. can just download it. Okay, cool. So you'll, later you'll tell me exactly the URL and we're going to put it on the show notes. Perfect. And so as far as uh, letting your feelings get hurt or not letting your feelings get hurt, uh, we're actually touching. In that book, I had two pages on political correctness. And that actually is evolving into a major book. This is going to be my eighth book. Mm -hmm. I'm more than halfway through. It's called The Cause of Death, Political Correctness. And it really talks about, or part of it talks about how political correctness kills creativity, productivity, and profitability. Well, the we are so focused today on how to not hurt your feelings, uh, somebody else's feelings, that when we enter 
a dialogue, a, an argument, a debate, we enter it from such a politically correct position that we can really not put everything on the table. We can't really reach a conclusion, a positive, a, a creative, an effective uh, conclusion. So what I'm trying to do is have people, when you build the trust and you have them accept the vulnerability of asking stupid questions. You know, when you go into a company and you say, I'm going to ask a stupid question, the immediate, the instinctive answer that you get is, there is no such thing as a stupid question. My response to that is, oh, yes, there is. 80% of my questions and my ideas are stupid, but that's life. And you just tell me that it's stupid and let's see if it is. Let's see if there is something better. But if I'm going to be afraid to ask a question because it might be stupid, then we're not getting to the most creative solution. Furthermore, if you tell me that there is no such thing as a stupid question, and then you find that, unfortunately, my question actually fell into the 80%, and it is stupid, now you're stuck. You can't tell me it's stupid because you just promised me that there is no such thing. So <laughs> I'm trying, in when I say constructive conflict, I'm trying to get people to do three things. The three things are, one, be vulnerable. Allow yourself to be vulnerable and ask stupid questions, suggest stupid ideas. Two, feel comfortable enough providing feedback to that person who suggested a stupid idea. Be able to tell them, you know, that was a stupid idea. Let's, let me tell you why. The third one is be confident enough in yourself to accept that criticism. You do those three things in meetings, and and, and by the way, the, the, the basis for this is having trust uh, among the team members. But you do those three things in a meeting, and you will have constructive conflict. You know, I remember, Haleli, you and I are, uh, we share something in common. We both came from Israel. And I remember this one day I was sitting in an Einstein Brothers uh, restaurant, and uh, there were two Israelis sitting near the window. And they were talking and they're starting to talk louder and louder and they were yelling and, you know, people started moving away from them and they created some kind of a demilitarized zone around <laughs> them. Nobody wanted to sit next to them and they were speaking Hebrew. And so I understood every word that they said. This was not personal. That discussion was not personal. They were arguing about something they're doing in work. I can tell you that these are two friends that trust each other and can conduct constructive conflict that leads to creative results. And uh, unfortunately, here we are so afraid to be that open, to be that blunt, to be that vulnerable with one another, that what we have, what we end up having is we have the meeting before the meeting, the meeting after the meeting, just not the meeting during the meeting. Mm -hmm. It's true. And of course, you're, you're touching on an issue that is maybe a big part of this equation, which is culture. You know, of course, the organizational culture is one and the relationship culture, you know, what's your past with this person and what's what's been your experience? That's certainly going to inform, you know, how comfortable you are entering into an open conversation with them in the future. And then, of course, you have national culture, right? And we all know that there is a very different orientation towards conflict and directness in different cultures, Israel being a very direct culture and a very egalitarian one. And then there's cultures in the world like, you know, many of the Far East cultures where you, you should never even disagree with someone to their face, you know, and saying there's like saving face and saying no is rude and you should not say no. And so talk about the difficulty of saying what you think when you try to conform to the rules of the culture. So I could see how as an Israeli in the U.S., you see the difference very clearly because you recognize that it could look different. You know, you've experienced it. But to I think to many Americans native to this culture, that's just the way we do things. So I, are you trying to change national culture here? Oh, yes, of <laughs> course. We actually, you know, you know how you change the national culture one team at a time. Just one team at a time, because here's, I'll give you a perfect example. So I worked with one team. This was about six months ago. I think two, three days ago, I saw an email from the person who contracted me to do that one workshop to their uh, training manager. I think that's, uh, that's her title. The training manager 
saying, you have to bring this guy in. He was with us for one day. That was a pivotal moment to our group. So guess what happens now? Next year, I'm starting to work on team by team for that company. One team at a time, one company at a time. Awesome. And that's true. Um, you change, you know, grassroots change, start to make a change locally in small bites and eventually it starts to spread. So we're about to run out of time. And before you share a very actionable tip with listeners, uh, Yoan, what's new and exciting for you on your horizon other than writing 10 million books a day? Well, actually, it's writing 10 million books a day. <laughs> it's uh, my eighth book. I, I can tell you one thing. The, it is a different book. It's a book about political correctness, the how, why, and what of political correctness. But uh, that book, especially the second part, why do we have so much political correctness, required a lot of research, and it drew me in to writing it, it more than any other book that I wrote before. So that's going to be a very exciting one. Of course, uh, as you mentioned at the beginning, uh, yesterday, the Culture Starts With You just came out as an audiobook, and now it's available on Audible and iTunes and, and everything. Those, those are some of the things that are exciting for me today. Very cool. And, and, and you're a busy guy. You put out a lot of content into the world. So thank you for that. What's one specific action that listeners can take today, tomorrow, this week to make them even more innovative, more effective leaders? I think the big thing is, is I go through everything, all the little factors. I think the biggest one is building trust. And that formula that I described that, that has more details in the book or in the audio book can help them. But if you start looking at those factors, those simple factors, how much time you spend together, how intense is this time that you spend together, don't do it over email, and how positive that time is, you will just accelerate building trust. And when you have trust, you will have the ability to do constructive conflict. And that's the foundation for creativity and productivity. Fabulous. And so I know listeners are going to go and check out your book. It is titled... Culture starts with you, not your boss, as well as your uh, five other books. All of that is on Amazon. And I know that we're going to link to the books. We're going to link to your website. Where else should people follow you or connect with you to learn from and about you? Well, they can go to uh, yoramsolomon.com or even better, largescalecreativity.com. Uh, of course, uh, one other name that I uh, use is uh, corporateinnovationacademy.com. Think about the acronym for a second. <laughs> Yes, it is CIA. <laughs> you can follow me on Twitter. I have the Twitter handle Yoram, Y-O-R-A-M. And that's a long story because I was one of the first Twitter users. Yeah. And of course, on Facebook, uh, Large Scale Creativity, uh, it's all there. Just search Large Scale Creativity, you're going to find me. Fabulous. And we're going to link to all of that. So Yoram, thank you so much for your time today and sharing your wisdom with the talent growers. Appreciate you. I enjoyed it. Thank you for having me, Halili. What did I tell you, talent growers? Funny guy, right? And really interesting. So I hope that you will go and check out the show notes page and get a copy of Yoram's books. It's at talentgrow.com forward slash podcast forward slash episode 72. Plus, I hope that you listened to my first Ask Haleli episode, which was the previous show. 71. And I made a request there that I want to repeat here, which is I'm trying out some new formats. Most of the shows are interviews and conversations with experts like Yoram, but I also want to sometimes do little intermittent shorter episodes like Ask Haleli, where I answer questions that I get from listeners, from the media, from workshop participants, from audience members. And I would love to feature you in one of those. So you can leave me a voicemail on my website. And if you give me your permission, I can just use your question and your voice and you can be on the Talent Grow Show. How cool would that be? Plus, of course, you can submit any kind of other feedback on the voicemail or emailing me or commenting on social media or sending me a direct message. I really want to hear from you. So if there is a suggestion you have, if there is a, an idea you have for a type of episode I could do or an idea that you have for a guest or a topic, this is what I want to know. So please, please, please give me that information because I create this show for you, talent growers, and I need to hear from you. What do you want? What do you need? How can I help? Well, this is it for another episode of the Talent Grow Show. I am Halelia Zulai, your leadership development strategist here at Talent Grow. 
And until the next time, make today great. Thanks for listening to The Talent Grow Show, where we help you develop your talent to become the kind of leader that people want to follow. For more information, visit talentgrow.com.